Hello, I'm here with uh, Professor Sheila Dow, Professor Emeritus at uh, Stirling University and a longtime friend of mine. Th thank you very much for uh, agreeing to be interviewed by us. Mm. Um, I wanted to ask you about what you're going to be presenting at the conference. I'm going to be talking about uncertainty, which is something that's um, very much in people's minds because of the crisis. But um, and this is something I've worked on for a long time. But what I want to focus on here is the way in which uncertainty um, affects the structure of the economy. It's not just a matter of how it affects behaviour, although that's really important. But I want to talk about the way it affects structure, which really reinforces the, the Keynesian argument that uncertainty ought to be taken seriously in, in economic theory. As because, well of course, Keynes uh, recognised the importance of, of uncertainty. In, in a sense, the, the whole idea of animal spirits uh, overrides the uncertainty element. So it, 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 uncertainty is implicit in his whole uh, economic analysis. Indeed. And, I mean, it, it's right from the foundations up. I mean, it comes from his work in philosophy, which predated his economics. So to, it really um, is right in at the ground. And, and I mean, what I'm particularly concerned about is the fact that mainstream economists, while they're talking more about uncertainty, are not really grappling with an inability to quantify risk. And they regard it as something to be added into theory. Yes, they, they, they don't seem, they, they ought to After be reading that. a bit more of Frank Knight because he seemed mm -hmm. to have a, a, the idea that at a certain level, uh, that genuine uncertainty uh, is, is a, an almost a, an unquantifiable form of risk, and that's what he, I think, defined it. Absolutely. And in, in the crisis, I mean, we saw markets freezing, which is very concrete evidence of an inability to, to price. And, and, and to, you, you, the other thing that you've been doing is you've actually drawn, you've taken quite an interdisciplinary approach, like Keynes, of course, Keynes, it was drawing mm -hmm. on philosophy, but you've also done some of the work and in, 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 uh, looked at some of the latest uh, psycho psychological studies. Mm -hmm. um, and my understanding is that, you know, that what we're learning about the way human beings react to radical uncertainty, what the psychologists are teaching us, is very different from what the economic textbooks teach us. That's right. And, uh, the reason I, I look to psychology is because, um, I mean, following Keynes, it's, it's clear that human decision making is not separable into rational, optimizing economic decision making on the one hand and emotional um, reactions on the other, which are defined by many as, as irrational, that rather it's a, a combination of the two. And when I look at that, in fact, I'm going back to the Scottish Enlightenment tradition because that's a, an idea that's very important to Smith and Hume. Clearly, it's something that wasn't read though by the, say, the rational expectation school people. No. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and what do you think the, the, the implications that are, um, first of all, for, um, for, for the way we teach economics? Hmm. Well, I'd, I'd like to see economics, for a start, being taught in terms of the possibility of different approaches to the subject. I mean, I obviously have my own views about what the approach that I prefer and, and the type of theory I prefer. But I think it, it's important for students to be aware that because of our uncertainty, we have to choose between a range of different approaches um, and have to be able to um, justify whichever approach we take to others. And, and you mentioned your own personal preferences, so why don't you elaborate on those a little bit? Well, my preference is for, for a post-Keynesian approach, which is a, a, a particular interpretation of Keynes, which draws on his philosophy as well as, as, as part and parcel of his economics. Now, here, clearly, uh, uh, there, there's a lot more of a revival in, 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 in Keynesian thought, more, of course, mm. in, in some ways, um, helping to, to promote that here at, mm. at, at INET. Mm. Um, but um, in the world, the real world of policy making, uh, we don't seem to be making much headway. Um, and that's uh, particularly uh, uh, prominent in the, in the UK, where you're resident. Uh, would, you, would you care to comment on that? Mm -hmm. There is. A lot of public discourse about Keynes, which there wasn't before the crisis. So at, at, at least there is an awareness of Keynes's arguments about uh, the need for fiscal stimulus in a recession. What's missing is all the rest of Keynes, which provides an explanation for the crisis, really building on his theory of, of uncertainty. 
Um, and th that's why I think it's so important just now to be, um, to focus on that aspect of Keynes's thinking, big, rather than to think of it as something that's just the effect of a crisis, but actually to understand the way economies behave in, in non-crisis times. And, and what, what do you think the implications of that are, say, for, um, you know, we're, we're doing a lot on the regulatory front right mm. now. What mm -hmm. do you think the implications of this uncertainty principle, if you like, are in, for, in terms of regulation? Well, I think it, it's, uh, it's more important in terms of thinking about the sort of institutional structure mm -hmm. within which regulation occurs and the way in which regulators can encourage practices. The, the trouble with regulation is that it, it imposes constraints on a sector which doesn't like constraints and is very innovative at responding to, to constraints. So, I mean, I'm not arguing against regulation as such, but what I'm arguing is that there has to be as much attention to the institutional structure, the way in which um, the regulators, the, the, the monetary authorities, behave with the banking sector um, so that th there needs to be a build-up of a relationship between the two as there was um, up until the 70s, where there was a, an understanding that the, the central bank and, and commercial banks had an, an obligation to each other. The, the banks were effectively franchised mm -hmm. to yeah. produce society's well, there money. And there was a recognition of a public-private partnership. I mean, the, yeah. the banks are, are somewhat unique in, in, in mm -hmm. that regard because mm -hmm. it, it is the only business where effectively um, your liabilities, the, the business's liabilities are backstopped mm -hmm. by the government. So that implies a public-private mm -hmm. partnership. Mm -hmm. Yet the banks don't seem to see it that way unless they're losing money, at which point all of a sudden the, 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 the public backstop becomes very important for mm -hmm. them. Yes, but I mean, deregulation gave them much more free reign to pursue that that line so that they sort of backed off their side of the deal. And we don't really seem to be re-regulating. It seems to me that we have an increasingly complex uh, structure uh, and that we are, instead of trying to simplify that structure to deal with, the, say, the challenges of uncertainty, mm. we seem to be introducing more and more cumbersome regulations, which in turn the bankers try to game and uh, so the, the system doesn't fundamentally change its results and it doesn't deal with the challenges that you've set out. Mm. Yes, I, mean, I think it's really important to address the issue of the culture of banking. And I mean, this is something that, that is discussed um, quite widely in, uh, in the Financial Times, I mean, in, in public discussion, but, but not in economics. And I think there's an obligation in economists to be able to provide some guidance and how would you, um, how would you suggest that? Uh, what, what would you, if, if you were in a position, if the Chancellor miraculously, and I think it would be a very good idea, were to call you tomorrow <laughs> and, and ask you for advice, what would you tell him in regard to, say, uh, banking hmm, specifically? Well, for a start, I'd say take advantage of the fact that you have um, a lot of sway over the, the banks in which there is large public ownership. That, that, that should have been a wonderful opportunity to push a change in culture by example. And I know it's a very difficult thing to do, but it's something that th there has to be some change. Now, this is often thought of as something outside economics, but what I'll be arguing later on today is that this is, this is very much part and parcel of, of the way in which an economy functions that because of uncertainty. It requires conventions, um, conventional practices, um, trust, all these things before anything else There can are happen. sociological and political uh, and, and indeed value judgments yeah. which come into it, which yeah. of course, um, uh, the, uh, the, as you say, that's been one of the weaknesses of the economics profession. Mm. It, um, it uh, forgets that it's a social science as mm. opposed to, uh, and, and likes to think of itself as a science. And, and, and even mm. science is not de devoid of, of value judgments, which mm. uh, but the economists mm. seem to think it can all be, or mainstream economists seem to think it can all be reduced to a, a, a simple mathematical equation, the sum mm -hmm. of human experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that, that, that seems to be where the, 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 the challenge seems to lie. And, and like you, I, 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 I thought that the UK um, had a very strong approach. They, they took huge chunks of these banks. But I get the sense that they're losing their nerve now, that there, there was talk about breaking them up, making them to uh, smaller, less systemically dangerous institutions. But the, uh, under the lobbying influence of the banking industry, that seems to all be changing right now. Mm. 
Well, I, I mean, I don't have any sort of particular information about how how things are going, but I think it, it it would be really important to split off retail banking because it's retail banking that provides society's money. Um, now, it's difficult to be a lender of last resort to massive institutions which are engaging in all sorts of practices which are not the business of, of traditional retail banking. Um, so I mean, what I'd like to see is a return to the idea that, that um, we have retail banks which are, which are fairly constrained and yet have the privilege of, of uh, lender of last resort facility from the government. And so I, th I think it's important that the presumption be that banks don't fail. In other words, it's, I think it's important to look at banking in, in, term, in positive terms about what banking can and indeed should do Good old fashioned credit, credit intermediation, for example, as opposed to. Yes. Um, because the Lord Adair Turner, for example, talks about how uh, about 90% of the investment banking activities uh, don't have any so kind of social utility. Well, that's. Uh, yes, I mean, he made a bold statement, a statement about that. I'm um, not sure he's wrong about it, though. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. how, but how do you um, uh, segregate that in the, institutionally uh, in, in the UK context? Yes, it's, it's. I mean, there are clearly huge difficulties. Um, I mean, as I understand it, it should be possible to ring fence retail banking within large organisations. I mean, it requires That was um, what she very was careful recommended under the Vickery report. Right? Yeah. Yes. Um, I mean, in some ways, the more satisfactory approach would be to separate retail banking off in institutionally. Um, but it, it it could also be possible to ring fence, but it really requires very close attention to what banks are doing. I mean, it's, to my mind, it's really important for the, for the authorities to have really close knowledge of what's going on on the ground within banking, so that they can be alert to any changes in practices and. And, uh, the, the, the problem is, of course, with the, the conventions and the practices keep changing. They keep getting much more um, a, mm. a, elaborate, and it's uh, it's particularly difficult um, to achieve banking dis discipline via the uh, liability side of the of the bank's balance sheets. And I, I I've always mm. felt that the important thing to do is to restrict the range of activities uh, mm. uh, so that mm. you don't actually have this this complex regulatory structure. Yes, yes, I think that. But, the, but that, that, there, there doesn't seem to be anyone moving in that direction, even though that would be consistent with what you've mm -hmm. been uh, arguing in your mm -hmm. papers, for example. Yes. I mean, there is talk about, um, I mean, f what seem to be straightforward measures like loan, restricting loan to asset ratios and, um, and so on, which would get round the, the problem of, of excessive mortgage lending, for example. So, that, you know, I think that there's a long a lot that can be done with fairly simple, uh, simple regulation. And do you get any sense that there, there's any movement in that direction, uh, any recognition of this uh, in, in, in policy uh, circles in, in the UK? Hmm. Um, it's certainly widely talked about. Um, but it may have to wait for another government. Who, kn who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I think at that uh, somewhat less than hopeful note, we'll, we'll leave it there. But um, thank you very much for agreeing to uh, speak to us. Mm, it was pleasure. very enlightening. Thanks a lot. <laughs>